welcome to yet another episode of the new space india podcast the phenomena of venture capitalists investing in new space startups in india has been very recent it's been only in the last 2 or 3 years that we've seen companies like bellatrix pixel and others raised venture capital through sources within india however there are no real space focused or aerospace focused dedicated vcs that are available in india and most often it's deep tech or deep sciences kind of vcs who then end up investing in some of these companies and keep in mind that some of these investments are first time investments into a sector like space from these vcs within india over the last few years we've seen a new phenomena emerge in the global market where we've seen the emergence of venture capitalists who are looking to solely back space or aerospace startups and have created funds to do so starbridge venture fund is one such source of capital which is backing space companies in us europe and other destinations in this episode of the new space india podcast we have michael meeling who is a general partner at starbridge venture capital talk about his perspective as a venture capitalist of the emerging indian new space scene the positives the negatives and the do's and don'ts for upcoming entrepreneurs michael was a co-founder at maston space systems and is the ceo of the wayfaver foundation as well as the president of the moon society given that michael has experience of seeing companies being built from scratch raising money for them and making them sustainable as well as looking at some of the failures at various stages of companies this episode becomes very insightful for anybody who is looking to understand the landscape of venture capital financing of space particularly with a focus on vc money availability for indian companies hi michael uh, welcome to this uh, episode of the new space india podcast Thank you. Glad to be here. Um uh, always fascinated by uh what's going on in India and in the space industry and uh happy to learn more. As uh, an investor who's actively investing in uh, you know startups uh, primarily mostly in the US, what is your image of uh, the Indian industry, space industry in general and you know startups? Sure. Starbridge actually invests globally. Just in our first fund uh we have one company in the U- in Canada and one company in the UK we will take investors from around the world as long as it's legal for us to do so um and we will invest in any company around the world again as long as it's legal to do so so we're always out looking for the best companies regardless of where they're at um we actively look at companies in Latvia we've actually been pitched and talked to several companies out of India already um so we the interesting thing is the space sector um is very global and one of the things that that um uh, we've and I've learned just from my past with international companies working with them but also doing the startups is there are a lot of cases where businesses have to have access to the local market where they're they're selling into um you really do it, it's very difficult for a US company to go into a foreign country and and just do what they've always been doing because of local customs local laws um uh, just the local network of who knows who and how you do business and so a lot of times it's far more efficient to find a company that is in the country that you you actually want to access their market so we look for companies that really do understand in this example indian markets indian customers customs how business is done um the legal frameworks for how you do business and so it's a lot easier to um be able to get access to a market when you have someone in country who understands that market and so india represents a large enough market segment that the returns that we can see from a company that is in india focused on the indian market or at least the entire indian subcontinent um there's a lot of opportunities there just because of the market size um now somebody for example we've been talking to a company in latvia 
Um, if they were just focused on the Latvian market, that's really not large enough to justify it. Therefore, they're accessing the entire European market, which makes it interesting. But India itself is large enough, diverse enough, and modern enough economy that it makes sense for us to focus on that as a market segment you know, in and of itself. Beyond that, the, the technical acumen of the Indian market from top to bottom um, is sufficient that it can actually generate solutions on its own. It's not um, like other markets where you may have a population size that justifies it, but you're not going to see an indigenous um, creation of technology coming out of it just because of the maturity of the market that they're in. Um, I first had an introduction to the Indian space community when I met uh, the team um, that was building the Lunar Lander as part of the Google Lunar Lander Challenge. And I was really, really struck by their ability to innovate and build at very low cost. Um, one of the things about the US and Europe is it's, and this comes from the legacy of NASA and ESA really, it is very um, what we call gold-plated. Um, everything is, is over-engineered and, and cost is, is almost not a consideration. Um, so we really are interested in some of the, the innovation that you see in India for figuring out how to do more with less, um, which is what I wish everyone around the world would do in space, but you still have those legacies. And, and if you intend on selling to NASA at some point, you have to at least assume their kind of gold-plated nature of what they, they want. Um, whereas I, I don't think that India is saddled with that legacy as much. And so that, that's one of the things that's kind of compelling about the Indian market. Right. You talked about some of the Indian startups, you know, approaching you guys, for example. Why would they approach you? Was it because, uh, you know, there's not enough investor interest in India or not enough investors in India? Or is the check size not, you know, big enough for them? The comment that we got was... Um, and this is a, a problem that we see around the world. Um, space companies, the space business is very lumpy in terms of revenue. And it takes a considerable amount of time to get the technology um, perfected, get a launch, get whatever you're trying to build built, that debt-based debt solutions often don't match what the company's capital requirements are because you may look for an investment and if the investor wants to do it as debt and the debt service is large enough, you're not going to be able to see revenue that you can then service that debt for probably at least two to three years. And that means that you're servicing that debt out of the funds you got from the debt. And so you're basically burning money for its own sake and it's not capital efficient. And so in some cases, um, the companies were looking for actual equity investments. Um, and, and that was something they were finding difficult in the Indian market. And that's something that most U.S. investors assume it's equity to start. And so we come at it from a different angle. Um, but it was also the fact that they didn't have to sell us on the sector. So there was the entire part of the conversation that they would normally have to do that they can just skip over entirely. And so they can just skip that. We understand the technology. We understand the market. And it really was just a, we can jump immediately to what their plan is. And so it was a much faster, much easier conversation. Um, for example, one of the earliest investments that we wanted to get into, um, and you'll have to forgive me, I'm blanking on the name of the company, but it was a hyperspectral analysis company, analytics um, focused on the agricultural market. Um, I think it was Satchure. And we were trying to get into that deal and we were discussing it with them, but then Intel came in and took the entire round. And that was the kind of company and the thing we liked about that particular deal was they had a deep knowledge of the Indian agricultural market. 
And that was a key differentiator from somebody coming in going, I'm going to build a generic analytics platform for satellite data. And yes, that is still needed in a lot of places, but in order to be able to do that well, you actually have to understand what kind of questions the customers are trying to answer with the data. And you don't know that until you actually know the market in which you're selling. And that's the key differentiator is how well do you know the problems of Indian farmers, Indian oil, you know, infrastructure, industries, those are all going to be very specific by country. And so that's why it was kind of interesting to us. It was really the ability to get directly to the point and not have to sell space in general, but also a lot of these companies were looking for more e equity than that. How large do you think is uh, the Indian new space ecosystem in your perspective? I really do think it's... Um, it is sort of where the U.S. was about 10, 12 years ago. So that means there are a lot of opportunities. Um, in a lot of the conversations I've had with uh, even Indian government officials uh, uh, between U.S. And, and India Chamber of Commerce, the, the conversations between some of the large of what we would call primes, which are ISRO's uh, subcontractors, it really does sound almost exactly like the conversations that we had in the U.S. in the mid-2000s. Um, companies like us were, well, us when I was at NASA and Space Systems back then, were saying to NASA, you know, let us do some of this for you. We will own it and we will do it and you'll get a much cheaper price and you'll get be able to move faster in the market. And that was almost universally met with, nope, just be a contractor like everybody else. Don't, you know, try to rock the boat. And then, you know, slowly things started changing. And it, it took, you know, it took 15 years. Um, and so I see a lot of that same opportunity in India. It's a different set of regulatory issues, but they seem to be on the same level of, effort in terms of overcoming those issues. One of, we talked about the regulatory framework. Uh, I remember, you know, while studying some of the space policy aspects, uh, how, for example, I think there was a law or some, uh, you know, I don't know, presidential order that uh, doesn't allow NASA to build stuff that the industry can that was, uh, you know, put in place, I think in the 80s or something like that, or 1975. And was immediately ignored, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, so that brings me to this point of, uh, you know, what do you see the regulatory environment in India as? And is this something that has to change drastically for, you know, investors like you to step in? I think it depends on how aggressive the Indian government wants to be in what Israel would end up doing. So... When it comes to NASA in the U.S., there is the, the very, very splashy human spaceflight program. But, and that is a large chunk of what NASA does. And then the, the, the space station is a resource by itself. But there's a whole, another budget around technology, the Space Technology Mission Directorate, the Science Mission Directorate, that are developing things that are not as flashy. Um, and so NASA represents a, a funding resource in a very early stage. So a lot of space companies will depend on the small business innovation research grants, SBIR grants that NASA does as a way to getting that early revenue in to help fund the R&D and the development that they're doing. And that provides a lot of that early um, funding that comes with companies. And so that's why NASA is um, important. But what the new space industry in the, in the U.S. is trying to do is get to more of a NASA is important, but it's not critical. Where NASA is one among several customers. And uh, as I learned in one of my previous startups, I want to have enough customers that if one of them goes away, I can still sleep at night. And so if, for example, there is a recession and the U.S. government decides to cut NASA's budget, 
it's not a life or death situation for us. And so that's, I think, one of the things that, that I currently see in the Indian market is there is still a, at least with some companies, there is still a focus on ISRO as being the gatekeeper for doing anything. And so like some of the conversations I've had is there's two ways to do space in India is you incorporate in India and you work within the framework that's there and you work with ISRO or you're still the, the employees are still based in India, but you incorporate outside of India and you actually act as more of a multinational to start with selling outside. And I think that's kind of, of where the transition that I think the, a lot of the Indian new space or companies are, are thinking about making is how much do I really need Israel? Um, and what laws and is there something that, that keeps me from doing it? If you're building a launch company and you want to do that within India and be able to sell that to the Indian government as an alternative to what, what Israel may be doing, then yeah, you really are dependent on that. But as in some of the other space businesses that are not specifically around launch, you probably don't need Israel at all. There are other companies and governments that you can sell to. Um, I, I do think that India's position as what we used to call uh, in, in my model UN days not aligned with you know whether it's US, China, or Russia, that puts you in a very strong position to be able to sell to countries that are also equally not aligned. And for example, we were talking to one company that originally started in India, but it has now gotten interest from the Brazilian government because it's a technology that is not aligned with the U.S. or Europe or Russia or China. And I think that's a lot of opportunity there that Indian new space companies can take advantage of. Yeah, I mean, that's a kind of a very unique uh, perspective to looking at all of this. But um, is uh, if, if companies are dependent on some of these regulatory barriers to be overcome, like, for example, you talked about a launch company, is that a turn off for you? Or would you want to see something change and then invest? Or you think that, uh, you know, let's go ahead and invest into a team or an idea if it's mature. And, you know, be given that this is all kind of positivist uh, developments, that things will fall into place. That's the, what would be your you know perspective? There is one school of thought that says a regulatory environment can create a moat that protects the company from competition. Um and I've seen that work, um, but it can limit the market that you can sell into. Yeah, you may own that market, but someone else, for example, this is what Elon is doing, is he's leapfrogging over the, the regulatory and, and what the current market is and building an entirely new market. And that is a story that resonates with the venture capitalists because we have to the, the return requirements that we have for our investors mean that um, a two to three X return on an investment is not sufficient. Um, I have to turn $100,000 into at a minimum $1 million within 10 years. And understanding that the of the 20 companies that I invest in, I expect all of them to do that, but honestly, only probably two will do that. So instead of 100,000 turning into a million, 100,000 actually has to turn into 50 million within 10 years. And so um, the regulatory environment that a company is in often can artificially limit the market size that they can go after. Um, so also we actually, because of how crowded the launch segment is, we generally just do not invest in launch at all. Um, we haven't to date, and unless somebody comes to us with literal warp drives or something like that and they can prove it, we will generally stay away from it. When you get outside of launch, there are other segments that we also feel are also overcrowded. In-space propulsion has a large number of players in various different parts of the electric propulsion spectrum. And all of that does depend on what you need the propulsion for. If it's orbit raising or, you know, to be able to deal with the fact that 
you may go for cheap launch, but you're going to get dropped off at a location which is, isn't where you want to go, then you need it. But how critical is it right right now? And can I get that 20x return that I need? But beyond that, those kind of areas, you're, you're outside of generally what most countries would deem as an issue that needs regulation because a lot of what new space companies are looking at is new enough that there is no regulatory environment for it unless you're in a country that says you have to ask me for permission to do anything. Um, when you do a lot of new space companies, you're, you're far enough ahead that no one really thinks about regulating you yet. Obviously, when you're in Earth observation, you do have to get an Earth observation license because of existing treaties. But, um, and depending on the country you're in, they can actually take a little while. Right now, at least in the U.S., NOAA, NOAA licenses can take up to a year. That's why we focus so much on streamlining our Earth observation licensing. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's the regulatory issues don't really aren't really an issue for us. And they're not really a, a selling point in terms of the, the moat aspects of it. But we do need to be aware of them when they come up because they can significantly slow down a company. And, for example, uh, when NOAA was doing Earth observation licenses, um, you would have a company that would spend all of their time developing the spacecraft. Like, okay, great, you know, the spacecraft is ready. Oh, we forgot to get, you know, now we need to start our NOAA application. You mean that's going to take a year? I can't not pay my engineers. If I don't pay them, they, they leave. And now all my, you know, core competencies around the technology go away. So now I have a year's worth of burn where my employees are kind of sitting on their hands waiting on the licenses. And so that, that's a real problem is if your regulatory environment just takes too darn long. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was uh, listening to... I think your colleague's uh, podcast recently, uh, a show where he was talking about investing and getting into space uh, investments. And uh, and he remarked that uh, there is deal flow from all over the world to you, but uh, he sees significant uh, value and significant quality of deals uh, still being mostly in the U.S. Is this uh, also true in terms of uh, what you see with, for example, the co companies in India that have you know come to you? The, the quality of deals that we see out of India um, are higher than most. They're definitely far higher than what we see in Southeast Asia. Um, I would put, in terms of the, the quality of the companies that are coming out of India, I would definitely put them on par with what we see in Europe. Um, and so if I had to rank outside the U.S. where we will be making investments, where I expect to be making investments, is... Um, Obviously, we're already in Canada and the UK, but right behind that is Europe and India. There, beyond that, everyone else is, is, is a little bit distant. There may be some companies in Japan and, 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 and Southeast Asia, but I mean, I, I really can't invest in China just because of capital control problems and, and you know, a whole lot of security problems. But I would actually, right now, in terms of investability, uh, I would almost put India right there on par with Europe. Um, the problem that we see with a lot of European startups is they are still very much attached to ESA. I'm probably going to insult some of my European colleagues, but they will echo this themselves once you get a couple of drinks in them. Also, profit seems to be a dirty word in Europe you're not allowed to talk about it. The euphemism that is used is sustainability. And as a venture capitalist, being able to take $100,000 and turn it into 10 million requires a company to be very, very focused on profit and you know, pleasing large numbers of customers. And with a few exceptions, we see in Europe that to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, I don't know if it, 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 some of it is cultural, some of it is um, just dependence on ESA, but I do see in India a, a more of an appetite to uh, go big or go home and, uh, and to be able to work outside of India and work outside of the existing space industry that is in India. 
Yeah, again, you know, that's a very uh, interesting answer because, uh, you know, you're, I think, one of the first uh, investors or outside of India who I've asked, you know, these kinds of questions about uh, Indian India. And I think if I asked the same questions, maybe 10 years ago, I would have had very different, uh, you know, answers from all of them. Yeah, 10 years ago, you would have gotten a very different answer about whether or not there were any investable new space companies in the United States either. Uh, 10 years ago, we had a lot of people talking about things, but... You know, I would not have invested in mass and space systems back in 2004, especially if I knew it was going to be 20 years before I got my money back. So, yeah, it, it's a process. And I think, you know, everybody's learning as we go. But, yeah, I would say that India is definitely further ahead than most. If you want to break this down into like upstream and downstream, I mean, having seen India work in the last 10 years or so, that any investment would be very natural to be done in the downstream because there's a large enough market that you said, you know, is uh, that can consume services and there's very little space-based services that actually are being produced that uh, kind of are consumed locally uh, in that sense. I know that there's a lot of uh, IT engineering services uh, that began in the remote sensing world that got, you know, like uh, offshored into India, but went back into U.S. Uh, once, you know, the, the offshoring was done. But then the local consumption of many of these services into end markets was not very well explored or, or integrated. And that's where you see some of these companies that are now coming up, right? For me, I think there's a lot more scope uh, in, in the whole downstream segment than the, than the upstream segment, purely because there's ISRO trying to still remain in its position and then the downstream is not really well captured. Right, I agree. And I think that... So one of the gaps that we see in the market um, that I keep going out to the industry and begging somebody to build is um, there's a concept in the music industry called ASCAP, and I cannot remember what ASCAP stands for, but in the U.S., this is the organization that whenever a song gets played on the radio, um, that that is recorded and sent up to ASCAP. And then the, the, the radio, the local radio station pays basically a subscription to ASCAP. And then ASCAP takes their subscription amount. And based on what songs they play, they route the payment, which is probably going to be small, but they route the payment to the artist that actually did the song. So it's a rights clearing house and a payments clearing house. In space based, uh, earth observation imagery, you have a lot of different providers providing different data sets and all of those data sets, whether they're terrestrial or space or a combination, they have different license rights and different payment schemes associated with them. But to answer a customer question, that is what someone's actually going to pay for, requires commingling that data into one local computation system to be able to do that analysis. And so how do you make sure that each one of those data providers and whoever developed the algorithms to be able to find the solution exists? And so one of the things that, that I've been looking for, and one of the reasons I was looking at that original Indian company was, was agriculture, was that kind of data analytics solution set that comes from you know, India's deep knowledge about, you know, IT infrastructure and how to do it and how to scale it. Um, my original um, and even sometimes hobby uh, was originally from IT. And so I've, I've worked with, you know, Indian IT experts for my entire career. And, and I have always been impressed with how much far smarter at it they were than I was. <laughs> and, so I was, as I think there's a core there from a data analytics standpoint um, that I think is a deep untapped resource within India that brings the IT resources from IT and the other uh, those other educational and infrastructure companies and marrying that with the space side, um, I think is a big opportunity that I would like to see more of out of India. Yeah, and uh, you know one of the trends that I've seen uh, recently is um, there's been companies in the U.S. that have been doing some of the offshoring work. Uh, you know, GoGo and Wiasat, for example, have offices in India. 
that uh, you know do network related stuff and software development but i just also ran into another company called skylo technologies which is raised uh, venture capital from softbank and is doing a, a satellite based iot constellation and you know they're doing uh, they're having hundreds of openings uh, up in bangalore because they opened a, a development center in bangalore and uh, one of the guys uh, you know who is running the operations in bangalore reached out to me saying you know we we are a company that is uh, primarily based in the us and but then we have this huge development center in bangalore and uh, we are a new space company who have raised uh, money from softbank and that's the way you should do it you know you know where you find the talent to do what you need to do do it there and there's just a tremendous amount of untapped talent in india so if you can outsource it sure i would do that in a heartbeat um the so one of our investments is um ubiqu uh, used to be called ubiquity link is now link global and they're the ones that are developing the it's essentially uh 3g and actually really 2g because it's just gsm um leo satellites so your your cell phone you know connects directly to the satellite uh just on the on the data side of gsm you can't do voice over it um but you will be able to get a cell anywhere on the planet. You can be in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and you still still get one bar and you can still send a text message. And so there are a ton of IoT devices out there that have those GSM chipsets in there and you can actually, they, they act as small cell devices. And you know that, that's the IoT play that Link Global has. I do think there's a lot of opportunities out there for IoT it just seems a bit crowded because I, I every every couple of months I see yet another constellation being built around IoT. I'm like, okay, are we duplicating ourselves, or you know, we're, we're taking the market and splitting it up, or are each one of these bespoke specific application specific ones? And if it is application specific, then we're not doing what the whole IoT story was about was it's about small devices cheaply communicating um, the data. But if you have to build an IoT constellation specific for a vertical business case, then you're losing a lot of the, the promise of IoT. So yeah, a lot of that really does confuse me a little bit, but um, that strategy sounds better than most. Right, and let's say, let's assume that uh, you are willing to invest in an Indian company. Do you think that uh, you would want to look for a local investment partner, a co-investor to monitor the company? Or would you want to like say, you know, if the opportunity is good enough, we will do it by just ourselves? Okay. Well, first of all, we're, I think we're too small of a fund size because everyone in the space VC world, we're all basically what's called emerging managers, which I'm not able to, you know, our fund sizes are all less than 20 million. And so I would not be able to take an entire round. But even if I was, especially when I'm investing in, in some place that I need to understand the local environment, I would definitely want a local partner. And, and so both from a regulatory and compliance standpoint, but I would need someone that can verify the company's plans around its go-to-market strategy. You know, what, how does the Indian market perceive what this company is doing? And and I don't have the judgment to be able to, to determine that. So I need that local partner. That's one of the challenges that I think we may run into is how many local Indian investors are willing to do the equity side versus the debt side. And I think that's one of the challenges is I need... I need an Indian VC to be a partner with. I mean, that was uh, what I was want planning to ask you next is that, have you talked to some of the guys who have invested in some of the new space companies in India as institutional investors? Not directly. I mean, actually, I've talked to one. Um, and there seems to be a desire uh, for a few of them to keep everything inside India. And I understand that from a, um, both from a, you know, we're an Indian VC, we want to invest locally here and we want to keep our companies because there's a there's a perception that, you know, outside VCs and outside investors will um, 
distract the companies or try to turn them in something else or try to take the technology outside or things like that. Um, and I think that just comes from getting to know each other and getting to know why that we would be investing. So yeah, on our end, um, there does need to be some work on engaging with the venture community in India to be able to build those coalitions and not be seen as the the outsider coming in just wanting to take advantage of something and not really understanding the market. Yeah, and uh, I'm happy to introduce you to some of these investors because I get uh, calls from a lot of them uh, asking me, you know, introduce me to companies or somebody else. So they're looking at some of this. So if you are you know, willing to have conversations, I'm happy to make an introduction. Oh, I, I would love to. How many of them, What what is their view? And I'm turning this into a flipping the interview. How do they view the space industry in India? Are these, I mean, they're not space focused, so they're generalist VCs. You know, how is that story working when you try to tell them what's going on? Actually, I recorded uh, an interview with one of the investors a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, the view that he had is that he said, we are uh, a deep science, deep tech focused fund. And we see space as a deep science and a deep tech uh, focused area. And uh, and therefore, we see an opportunity to invest here because uh, essentially these companies are going to create, uh, you know, products that can not just sell in India, but abroad, but at a substantially lower price. And that's where we see value. Uh, and that's where we see these companies succeeding. And that's a very good way of looking at it. I, I like that. So, yeah, that's... Um... How prevalent do you think that view is? I mean, I'm a person who is skeptical by nature often. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not somebody who is uh, leapfrogging, uh, you know, I would like to be a leapfrogging kind of person, but I tend to take smaller steps <laughs> by myself. So, uh, but then, you know, that's, uh, that's the world way that I have and I, I, uh, they have. And uh, I hope that kind of works. And, you know, I, I wish them the kind of the best, but essentially I see it in this way, right? So this two things to this if uh, somebody who's external who is participating comes in one is um, do you think that if somebody if outside comes in and invests as a foreign direct investment is the word that we used in india fti uh, that raises the expectations for the government and the bureaucracy to deliver because you don't want to have foreign investors you know put out a bad image of a country and i think uh, that could then change the gears in change in regulatory reforms uh, and you know essentially uh, foreign investors saying look you know i put in money in india and you guys are not delivering and then it's not because of the entrepreneurs it's you guys who are doing making the rules and you know uh, not changing gears in the reforms so that could be the positive part of it the negative part of it is if somebody says uh, you know, you have to be too aggressive or they're too aggressive terms or they're too aggressive uh, ways of trying to scale up the company. You know, that could be kind of the negatives uh, uh, because, you know, the way I guess the burn rates of uh, Indian companies against the burn rates of a European company or American company, I think, are very, very, very different. You could see even with my company, right, SatSearch, uh, we have to pay people more and, you know, the, the money that goes into payroll is a lot more considering the money you would pay if you were operating in India. Right. Yes. One of the things that across the board, or at least the, the, the space specific venture funds, we all are from the space industry. And so we understand how long some of this stuff can really take, um, regardless of what the company may tell you, it's going to take longer than you think. And we know how damaging bad deal terms can be. Um, I was on a, a, a podcast the other day, and the whole thing was a, it was it was comedy. It was meant to be a joke, and so I was the you know really annoying, uh, overbearing uh, venture capital actor guy, and I offered them um, uh, three. X liquidation preferences, full ratchet, anti dilute, you know, all the horrible, horrible venture capital terms you hear. Um, because it really was a joke. And anybody that offers you those kinds of terms um, is not an investor that you want. And they're taking advantage of a company that may be desperate because they can't raise money elsewhere. 
Um, we don't do that. Uh, I don't know any of the other space funds that do that because the, as soon as you start doing that, your deal flow just dries up to nothing because nobody wants to do business with you. And so when you go into, but even when you go into another country, um, and the, the company is, is embedded in that com that country's laws, you do get differences from a regulatory and legal standpoint that you have to work within. And so a, an external investor coming in thinking that U.S. venture terms are going to apply in India, no, you have to have that partner. You have to have local representation to tell you what you can do. But you know, th there's a difference between venture capital and PE. Private equity, at least in the U.S., is trying to figure out a way to squeeze more value out of the existing companies, whereas a venture capitalist is saying, no, I want to grow with you because my capital is just another tool for you to be able to get to be the company that we all want it to be. So I think that's why, at least in venture capital, the interests are more aligned. Um, so, yeah, if there's any Indian companies that, you know, are being presented deal terms on something and they kind of want kind of some kind of independent, you know, what sniff test, um, tell them to get in touch with me. I'll tell you whether or not, you know, those are reasonable deal terms. Um, and if somebody ever comes to you with like three X liquidation prefer preferences, run away. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, good advice uh, for people listening. Um, so you talked, uh, you know, initially about uh, having met the guys from Team Indus who were trying to build the whole uh, X price challenge. So you have the peers of Team Indus, uh, Astrobotic, and uh, I think uh, Moon Express, and uh, even one more maybe still active in the U.S. I've not been following them. Right, the uh, Maston Space Systems never did the the Google Challenge because they were focused on the suborbital market, but they are one of the, now one of the commercial lunar payload services companies. Um, and then there's yeah. also the the Bear Sheet Group, which was um, the Space Isle group that's out of uh, Israel. So um, I am I am happy to see that. You know, some of those teams now have survived. Um, I would, I do need to get back in touch with the team and this people to, to find out what, what the plan is. I I would really like to see ISRO do something with Team Indus, and I don't know whether any of that is these days, but I think there's some missed opportunities there within India. Yeah, I mean, that's the question that I wanted to ask you. You know, how did these companies manage to survive the 10 years, you know, without having much commercial traction? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know how some of them survived. I do remember when I was at Maston, and this was before we won the original um, Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge. That was a $1.1 million prize. You stay alive. I mean, nobody's getting paid well. Um, you keep your your staff, uh, your burn rate really low. But even then, um, there was one time where we missed payroll. And that was one of the worst times of my life when I've got employees that have young children and I can't give them a paycheck. That's character building right there. And we all pitched in, cleaned out our freezers and refrigerators and had a potluck at, at, the, at the shop. Um, and so this is one of the things that we learned. You can't measure this. But what we said at Maston was, this is the direction we want to go. Anything that was in a 45 degree vector off of that, as long as I'm vaguely going that way, do it because it keeps you alive. And of the original Lunar Lander Challenge teams from the mid 2000s, Maston is the only one that lived long enough to be able to win that uh, Lunar Payload Services contract. In the, in the case of, of Space IL, it was donations from high net worth individuals that saw the vision and were proud to have an Israeli team on there. So it was a little bit of a patriotic nationalism kind of, this is, this is an Israeli group. You know, we really, really need to support them. In the case of Astrobotic, they did a lot of other contracts for other things related to some of the LIDAR work that they've been doing. So it was, it was picking up contracts here and there that were sufficient to keep the company alive. And so, yeah, you, you get creative, you do whatever you can. Um, I know this sounds silly, but you create a merchandise website on Etsy and then you sell coffee cups with your logo on it. You know, every dime helps. Um, because in a lot of cases, especially in the space sector, 
if your business is really the, the knee of that curve is far enough into the future, you've got to figure out some other way to stay alive while you get there. And that's one of the things, one of the businesses, when a business pitches us on, this is what we want to do. And you can tell that what they're wanting to do is their strategy to get enough revenue in so they can actually do what they really want to do, but they're not telling you. That bothers me because you're, you're, you're bar what's in reporting world is called burying the lead. You know, that's not really what this company is about. It's about this thing over here, which is much bigger opportunity. Okay, sell me on that bigger opportunity. I'm fine with your interim strategy and we can talk about that. But a company that comes in and says, we want to build giant space stations that can handle thousands of people. I'm like, I, I feel you. I feel where you're going. I'm right there with you. How are you going to get there? And they go back, hey, this is how we're going to get there. We're going to start off doing this thing over here that most people don't really realize is related, but it's on our core technology path. But I have customers for that right now. I'm like, ah, this I get. Because one of the things that a venture capitalist loves to do is be able to invest some amount now, get to a milestone that's a significantly higher valuation, other investors come in, I can double down and have more money in that then gets me to another higher valuation later. That stair-step approach of growth is really key to what investors want. And so for a company that's, trying to stay alive and get through that, figure out how to do a stepwise approach to get where you're going, especially if where you want to go is so far in the future that you don't know how to get there. Planetary Resources had an interesting strategy at one point before Luxembourg came on, where they were going to take their hyperspectral imager and actually just point it down at the Earth and do become a hyperspectral Earth observation company. Um, because there was a direct, direct line between that and where they wanted to go with, planet, uh, with asteroid prospecting. Um, they were able to raise $20 million just for that particular line of business because that would have been a very profitable, almost a 3 to $4 billion business. But when Luxembourg came in and said, we want to invest in you to do asteroid mining, they dropped that entire product line. And if they had actually went ahead and still built out Ceres and built that business, PRI would still be in business. So yeah, do whatever it takes. Yeah, it's uh, again, you know, <laughs> you tend to think that companies are different from in different places, but they're really not when you think about it uh, in a in a way. Yeah, there's only certain there's only a limited number of ways to to, to solve chicken and egg problems and and. Uh, and a lot of times you just have to have a really old chicken. <laughs> the, you, if the chicken just figured out how to stay alive long enough to have enough time to figure out how to lay an egg, that's one way to do it. And um, you know, in the financial world, there's only a limited number of tools in the bag. And when it comes to business strategies for emerging markets, there's only a limited number of themes that we know that work. And a lot of them are just riffing on each other. So. Um, if anybody's looking at building a company in this sector and there's a component of what they're doing that's just going to take a, long, a large amount of time, you know, deep dive into how some other companies have done it and how some other companies have not done it. I think uh, the PRI was a really good example of a lost opportunity. Um, it was a good strategy, but as soon as you know, something shiny came along, you know, it got dumped and, and that was a mistake. Uh, you see other companies like Made in Space where they have been working with NASA on pieces of what they want to build and they've been able to stay alive because of, and stay alive and make money on those NASA contracts where NASA is basically paying Made in Space to develop the capability to be able to build what they want to build in the future. Um, that's another one. Uh, that sort of does depend on kind of the U.S. kind of SBIR way of, of doing things. Um, I I would if there was one reform that I would do in India is I would replicate the 
replicate and well fund the uh, SBIR process that we have in the U.S. Um, with ISRO. That would be really useful. That may require some culture changes within ISRO and within everything else, but I would strongly recommend that. It's, it's a hard row. It's, it's a ro- hard row to hoe when your business is 20 years in the future. And uh, one of the other aspects is the involvement of uh, policymakers, you know, Congress, uh, President Trump and the others, because uh, it seems like President Trump and his administration takes a liking to space quite a lot. And you saw the, the National Space uh, Council or something being reformed or created and uh, and so many other new reforms that have come up. Uh, and, you know, that's the thing that I see in India, that uh, there's our minister in charge of space is a doctor and he hardly cares about space, I guess. And uh, and I think, you know, given that in India, the structure is that the prime minister's office controls space, then it's very hard to reach the prime minister because, you know, he has every other sector in mind and every other decision to make. So I think space is on autopilot most of the time. So how, how do you get, you know, these... Uh, these policymakers involved and, you know, invested enough in, in supporting reform? So one of the things that, that we've been doing is for some of that space related policy that, so really up until mid two thousands, it was sort of the same thing is Congress and the white house sort of just outsourced anything space related to whoever was the current NASA administrator. And there was really no interest there. But then we started creating pockets of interest in space in other departments, diversifying who else was doing space within the federal government. And some of that was in uh, the FAA because the FAA was a regulatory body. And that when we created the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act, We worked really hard at FAA because FAA in the U.S. has a dual role. It is both a regulator, but it's also an industry advocate. It has both of those things. And so by putting the regulatory aspects of space and launch in the FAA, you also had an organization that was advocating for the industry at the same time. And that was completely outside of of NASA. NASA had nothing to do with it. Um, over the past 10 years, we've been moving things into the Department of Commerce. So when you go for an Earth observation license, you go to, through NOAA. Um, and NOAA is a part of the Department of Commerce because it's always dealt with weather, which is a significant agricultural commercial issue, not a, a climate change or, or you know, NOAA does a little bit of climate change stuff. But we kind of identified that the Department of Commerce was more business oriented. So that's why we want to move a lot of the regulations aspects into to NOAA, I mean, into Department of Commerce. So I would sort of look at whether or not you can move some of that, the things that you're asking for. They're not space. They are commerce. So if you go to the people that deal with international commerce and commercial regulations and things like that and say, we are the space industry. We're not Israel. We're, we're doing things in space, but we're doing it commercially. So we're just like any other industry that you advocate for and you deal with. How can you help us? So I would look at those other agencies and other groups within the Indian government that might actually become your advocates to act as a counterweight. Yeah, I think that's uh, also quite good advice in that sense. And I always keep telling people that uh, we can actually leapfrog the regulatory framework that U.S. has because, as you said, the U.S. has FAA, it has uh, FCC, it has uh, NOAA, it has the the Commerce Department, and you know all of the them coming together to to have the space industry work. And I keep telling people in India that look, you could create one body in all that can do everything that all of these you know organizations do in the U.S. and and then deliver on, and then that could be. Like, you know, the leapfrogging regulation reform and institutional reform that you could do. And that would actually make look India as a reasonably well-regulated and, you know, destination. Right. That is a good strategy. Find people that can execute that strategy that are very, very patient. Because it will take a long time. 
and you will have people that will not agree with you. Um, the other suggestion from having done this is make sure that the regulations are based on actual proven harm because it is very easy for someone who is a, a bureaucrat who would run that group to assume that because of what they've seen on TV, um, especially really bad science fiction movies, and everything, that assumes that space is incredibly dangerous. Um, your satellite is going to fall on our head and it's going to kill everybody. Or you're going to go into space and come back with alien viruses that, it, you know, it, it's, it's all that kind of stuff. You have to make sure the people that are, that run that, that group understand what they're doing. If not, you know, they get paranoid. Um, we've seen, I've seen that in Congress. We talk about the things that we do when we go to, to talk to Congress about the industry. And the, whatever the last bad science fiction movie that came out was, that's what they focus on. And we're like, no, no, space doesn't work that way. I mean, a very interesting conversation in that sense, because I don't know if you had a chance to read the draft of, uh, you know, what ISRO had put out as the draft space uh, policy bill. And, you know, and it had a clause where you could uh, have been jailed for, I think, three years in prison and, you know, fined like $200,000 or something like that for creating space debris. And they didn't mention what is space debris. <laughs> wow. I didn't get to that one. I saw that. I saw the thing about the penalties, but I was assuming that some of those terms were defined somewhere or something. Yeah, there's there's often a des a desire among regulatory groups to create very bright lines and very severe penalties for going across that line. Um, and the, 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 the space industry and the environment, how you do things just is not that clear. Um, and it will never be that clear. And I think it comes from, and I've seen this tendency in the U S too. It comes from space being n new enough that most regulators don't know how to think about it well enough. So they just create very arbitrary regulations and then hope that you push back and help them figure out the right answer. So it's almost like if I create something bad enough, you will come help me write something better because I don't know how to do it myself. I've, I've seen that happen in the U.S. So they, they there was one um, there was one proposal that came out um, that was just over the top catastrophic for the industry, and the um, the statement from the regulator afterwards when the industry response came back was, "I knew that if I made it bad enough, you would pay attention." So, what is your reading of uh, let's say China? Because I think it's a very interesting market. I just saw a, a study from IDA that listed. I think something like 80 new space companies in China and having raised maybe, I don't know, roughly $2 billion in all today. Have you had a chance to review some of the investments or, you know, the thesis behind some of them? There was actually a really great article um, that came out about, it was about three weeks ago now, that analyzed all the, the companies and did a really nice matrix of whether or not they were state-owned, quasi-state-owned, independent um, and where their money came from, whether it was equity versus debt. And, um, and even then, for each one of the companies, who was their primary customer? Was it government or commercial? Um, and by and large, it really, so I spent about three weeks in, in China when I did my MBA. And one of the things that was very clear was the, the Chinese government comes out with its five year plans and they say, you know, for example, there was one uh, several years ago who said, we want to own the entire flat panel display market. So everybody started creating uh, LED displays um, and just flooded the market with them. Well, uh, a few years ago, in the last round of that, the Chinese government said, we would like there to be commercial space companies. And you are now authorized to do that. And we're going to make it legal for you to do so. 
and made some regulatory changes about how you deal with the uh, the Chinese military and the, and the government side. And then a whole bunch of companies said, "Great, you know, there was always this this thing in China that as soon as the Chinese government says that." A lot of people rush in because that's been the, the history to date, which is when the Chinese government says we're going to go into this segment, there's a lot of money availability and everybody makes a lot of money out of it. But I think what has happened was what the Chinese government said is we would like to see commercial launch companies. But there was no conversation around creating or incentivizing their customers. So I think a lot of the companies in China, the launch companies, have gotten to the point where they've gotten some demonstration flights, and now they're trying to close contracts, and there's no customers, so they're going back to the government and back to the military and saying, I need you to be my customer because there's nobody else in China that needs what I'm doing right now. And I think that's some of the challenge is why now some of these companies are, they started out commercial but they're going back to having, you know, the Chinese space program, the Chinese military being um, a major source of the revenue. Now, you've got the same thing in the U.S. NASA is still, for certain segments of the market, um, your primary customer. So maybe China has just experienced the same lack of you know, downstream kind of, of uh, applications for some of these technologies. Um, and, and there's a lot of companies that we don't invest in because we can't figure out who the customers are for some of these technologies. Um, so I think that's what you're kind of seeing in China right now. Um, there was one company, um, and I'm blanking on the name. It's either LinkSpace or iSpace. Um, iSpace is a very common space company name. People should stop using that. And um, <laughs> they, when they originally started they tweeted about the fact that they were inspired by what we did at Mast and Space Systems and were copying what we did almost exactly. And several of their first um, tests, their vehicles looked awfully similar to what we developed. Same kind of, you know, tether-based testing and everything else. And there was this great Twitter exchange between all the founders at Maston and then all these guys over in China that were doing the same thing. And they're like, you know, good luck. You know, we'd love to see what you're doing. It's great. Um, buckle up because this is going to be a long, long, hard slog in what you're doing. Um, but you, you saw that they made tremendous progress very, very fast. But now I see where they're at and they're almost in a little bit of a stall because the market isn't quite there yet for what they're trying to build. And I think that's the challenge. But I think that's a challenge for everybody in this business. Right. Uh, Michael, I've taken quite a lot of your time. So I want to end the podcast by asking you, you know, what would be your kind of general advice to young people who are trying to, you know, build up these new space companies in India and if there's a way that they can reach you? Um, sure. So to start off, my email address is michael at starbridgevc.com. Um, I'm also on the uh, New Space India Telegram uh, channel and a bunch of other ways to get me. Um, Starbridge VC is easy to find. Um, or you could just bug Narayan and, and he can tell you how to get in touch with me. As far as what I would tell new space companies in India that are looking at, at creating something is... Find a customer first. One of the hardest things to do in business is not the technology. It's not figuring out the solution. Um, the hardest part is finding a customer that has a problem that is hard enough and meaningful enough that they're willing to give you a lot of money to solve that problem. Then once you discover that as an engineer, you're able to sit down and say, what's the best way to solve this problem? And we see a large number of space companies coming to us pitching on what they think that a problem for someone far in the future may have, and they haven't validated that. And that customer is so far in the future that they currently even, currently even don't even exist. So you can't even validate whether or not they really do have that problem. Um, as engineers and having, you know, still an engineer, there are things that we want to do because we find the engineering to be compelling and fun and fulfilling. 
that is not sufficient to create a business around. Um, one of the reasons that we see a large number of launch companies, a large number of in-space propulsion companies is because in a lot of cases, that's what people studied in college when they were getting their aerospace engineering degrees. And so they're really trying to commercialize what their graduate thesis project was. Um, I would really try to find a good training program for how to do what we call customer discovery, how to listen. Um, one of the strongest, one of the most important tools for how to understand a customer is to find one that's willing to talk to you and then to shut up and listen. Learn what their problems are. Get to know that customer really, really well. And then figure out whether or not you can solve a problem they have. Um, that will save you so much time and effort when you go to build something and you find out the market just really doesn't care. My first startup, I did that. I just knew everybody needed what I had. And I spent about six months writing it on my own. Blew about, you know, $50,000 worth of my retirement. Really uh, upset my wife. And I finished it and then took it out to the marketplace. And all the customers were like, nah, FedEx tracking is fine. We really don't need anything that you've got here. Thank you very much. And I would, don't learn that lesson the way I learned. That's the most important piece of advice I can give anybody right now. Michael, this has uh, been a very insightful conversation. Depending on the feedback, I would love to have you back on the show and you know, talking more on the other topics. Sure. Be glad to come back. Uh, this is fun. And uh, again, like I said, uh, if anybody listening has any questions on details on how venture capital works and what we look at or why, just feel free to drop me an email. Thank you very much for getting on the show. Have a nice day. <laughs>